There are good and bad points in Return of the Jedi. As I said earlier, the technical magic is the true star of the film. Battle scenes are more explicit and complicated, and creatures of all kinds are also introduced this time around. And one group in particular called Ewoks are sure to outsell the E.T. dolls on the toy market. Character development is about the only thing that suffers in the picture, and even that is not enough to take away from any of the other elements. Of course, all is revealed this time around. We learn more interesting aspects about the main characters, Luke Skywalker, Princess Leia, and Darth Vader. Mark Hamill is good in the movie, but I don't think he is a good enough actor to carry the entire picture. Harrison Ford as Han Solo seems more hip this time around. Carrie Fisher and Billy DeWilliams don't seem to have as much to do in this film as compared to the previous picture. Darth Vader is still a bad dude, and of course C-3PO and R2-D2 are just wonderful. If it's action you want, then Jedi has it. Here in this scene, Princess Leia and Luke have started their final strategical move, and they get into what could be called a futuristic motorcycle race with some of the enemy troops. <laughs> This is the part you, the television viewers, see at home. Hi, I'm Karen Carney. And I'm Dave Hood. Tonight we're at the Omniplex, so stay with us for PM Magazine. And this is the part you don't see on the air. Great. Okay, let's go inside. And this is another part of the show very few people see, the Monday morning meeting, when the serious-minded PM staff comes in to make plans for the week. That's too much. Igor! Igor, settle down, Igor. My beat. Have a good weekend. Well, as you can see, they're not always so serious-minded. The Channel 4 PM staff is a creative and talented group made up of seven people, seven people also with a great sense of humor. They prepare for future shows at the Monday morning meeting. They discuss locations for shooting, story ideas, and so forth. They keep two weeks ahead of schedule. Therefore, when you see Dave Hood or Karen Carney on the show, that was actually videotaped two weeks before that. And when they do local stories, well, they're done anywhere from one to four months in advance. Tuesdays has the PM crew going out on location to shoot their stories. Now, everyone on the staff is multi-talented in that they all, at one point or another, produce stories. So while field producer Mike Borson is out shooting with Karen and Dave, associate producer Rip Buchanan and assistant producer Lisa Williams are back at the station editing what was shot the week before. Production assistant Amy Hornbeck takes care of a lot of the small details as well as post-production, and producer Kareem Kareem oversees the whole operation. I asked Karen and Dave what makes PM Magazine unique. It is local. You see, you can get a syndicated show from... Uh, and most of the other shows you see at that time of night are syndicated national shows. There is no local tie-in. So there's no way that they can really touch the people here, that they can go out and, and uh, you know, get local people who may be special in one way or another and, and put them on the air and, and show special people here in Oklahoma. And it's local because that is the one big advantage that we have over anything else is that we are here. And if you have something that you think you'd like to share with uh, the rest of the world, we're capable of doing that from Oklahoma. I also asked Dave and Karen about any misconceptions about the show they would like to clear up. I think probably one thing that uh, that we always get from the public, and that is that they, they think that Karen and I are either married or heavily involved, shall we say. <laughs> and, uh, you know, because that's what we're supposed to portray. We're the people next door, the, the, the you know, the, the couple next door. That look is what we portray on the air. and. Uh, we, we do like each other a lot, <laughs> but there's no truth to those rumors that uh, they were involved in any other way than just doing the show. <laughs> and so I wanted to clear that up right now so that there's no confusion in the future. Well, I think Dave has cleared everything up now. One area where there is no confusion about PM Magazine is its quality. The show provides you with information and entertainment and is good at that job as PM is one of the highest rated shows in Oklahoma City. With a behind-the-scenes look at PM Magazine, I'm Dean O'Lally.
The one picture to talk about this time around is Return of the Jedi, the concluding chapter of the middle trilogy of George Lucas's Star Wars series. Technically speaking, Jedi is the most elaborate of the three films. The technical magic is superb, with just about everything being believable. There are more ships in the battle scenes and more action overall. All the main characters are back. Mark Hamill as Luke Skywalker. Carrie Fisher as Princess Leia. Harrison Ford as Han Solo. And Billy Dee Williams as Lando Calrissian. Also back are Chewbacca, C-3PO, R2-D2, Darth Vader, Yoda, and Ben Kenobi. This being the last part of the trilogy, all is revealed. The true identity of the man in black, Darth Vader, is of course unveiled. Now, I'm not going to tell you anything more about that. You're going to have to see the movie to get the rest of the answers. A lot of new creatures and monsters are seen in Jedi. The one group in particular called Ewoks, which look like little teddy bears that didn't quite make it, are adorable. And I'll bet they will sell thousands of dollars on the toy market. The only flaw in Jedi is possibly the character development. For instance, Carrie Fisher and Billy Williams don't seem to have as much to do in this film. Now, although they are still very effective in their roles, as is everyone. Now, on my rating scale, Return of the Jedi gets a 10. It's full of action, suspense, humor, and more action that's all fast-paced, and it all makes for a great visual treat. Now, some other films we're seeing in town are Blue Thunder, the re-released Poltergeist, Local Hero. Now, so some semi-decent films, rating a 5 or somewhere in there, are Dr. Detroit and Breathless. That's it for now. I hope you have a nice Memorial Day weekend. I'm Dino Lawley. Virtually no other director in history has influenced filmmakers and audiences alike as much as Alfred Hitchcock, the master of suspense. How do you do? His skill as a filmmaker continues to shock us as in perhaps his most famous scene, the shower sequence from Psycho. It made a lasting impression on audiences as well as actress Janet Lee. I, d I don't like to take showers. That's the truth. I tub. And I, if I forced to, if that's the only way, I mean, to, to say that the, where I am only has a shower, has to be with the door open and I have to be able to see out. I cannot be closed in with either a curtain or a door, glass door. Because I'm scared. <laughs> now, 22 years later, a sequel to Hitchcock's classic has been produced, Psycho 2. Now, to make any movie is difficult, but to make one in the shadow of a film master is the ultimate challenge. Undoubtedly, the heaviest responsibility of all is on Australian director Richard Franklin, a lifelong student of Hitchcock. Shock and horror, uh, he thought, was okay, and he used it very occasionally. Hitchcock believed in telling you what was going to happen and then letting you sweat about it. Suspense was literally telling you how something was going to be resolved and then letting you wait for it to be resolved. Never before have so many years elapsed between the making of an original and its sequel. Hilton Green, producer of Psycho 2, was associated with Alfred Hitchcock for over 20 years and worked on the original. He feels they made a film Hitch would approve of. I sincerely hope he would, he's smiling right now, uh, and I think he would be proud of this production. I, I certainly hope so. Tomorrow on Action 4, we'll see what convinced the Psycho 2 cast and crew to check into the Bates Motel one more time. I'm Dino Lolly. Movie sequels have become big business in Hollywood. If a picture is successful at the box office, it isn't unusual to repeat a winning formula. But it is rare to attempt a movie sequel 22 years after the original. Alfred Hitchcock's classic thriller, Psycho, set new standards for shock and suspense. When the idea of a sequel, a Psycho 2, was first discussed in Hollywood, there was a great deal of skepticism. I generally do not like sequels. Hitch had just died fairly recently, and I <laughs> could have a vision of him turning over in his grave. Well, I think at first it appeared to be the kind of picture that uh, could have no uh, sequel, could have no second act, as it were. 
However, in the executive offices of Universal Studios, the feeling was that a Psycho sequel would have tremendous appeal and a built-in pre-sale to audiences. Yet it also had built-in problems. Executive producer Bernard Schwartz. There were many traps. When, when you realize that this was a classic, the uh, Psycho cult is a very strong cult. We knew that the critics would be laying for us. Uh, we were aware of the problems, but we were determined that we could uh, create a, a story that was worthy of, of a sequel. I'm convinced that the writer and the director have gotten together a story which uh, hangs together and hangs by itself as, uh, uh, as well as the original did. And thanks to the writer and director's work, both Tony Perkins and Vera Miles, stars of the original film, are back and are determined to uphold the legacy set by Hitchcock's classic. Everyone who was on it, uh, this picture, really loved that first picture, and there's just no way they, they were going to sell it down the river. Tomorrow on Action 4, the creators of Cycle 2 tell how they handled a tough controversial issue, not guilty by reason of insanity. I'm Dean O'Lally. What moviegoer can ever forget the shocking events that occurred in Alfred Hitchcock's classic film, Psycho? When an insane person commits murder, should he be allowed to re-enter society? That dilemma is one of the themes dealt with in the new film, Psycho 2, a sequel to the Hitchcock thriller. Norman Bates is judged, restored to sanity, and is ordered released forthwith. What about his victims? Don't they have any say? Can you restore them? Your Honor, my name is Mrs. Lila Loomis. I have a petition here signed by 743 people against Norman Bates' release, including the relatives of the seven people he murdered. Can murder be excused by reason of insanity? Executive producer Bernard Schwartz felt this timely issue made for a stronger film. I think it has a a great deal of uh, statements to make about a theme that's very relevant today, the insanity plea problem. There's been so much in our courts, in the media, that we felt it would make the story relevant. Are you satisfied, Doctor? Turning a murderer loose on an innocent public? Mrs. Loomis, Norman was not convicted of murder. He was found not guilty by reason of insanity. Making a film that was meaningful in today's society was not the only concern of the filmmakers. After all, they are dealing with a story that has become a genuine classic by the master of suspense. And in that regard, Psycho 2 is in no way a remake. It's a sequel that picks up where Hitchcock left off after 22 years. It's just a logical um, extension of the first story. Uh, Norman is released from the hospital uh, and uh, brought up to the house here uh, by his psychiatrist and says, you know, you're on your own and uh, call me if you, if you get into any trouble. And uh, that's how it begins. Tomorrow on Action 4, a profile of the star of Psycho 2, Anthony Perkins. I'm Dean O'Lally. Remember, luck favors the man with the most limpid minds, and I've got a bundle of them. I'm sorry, darling. I don't really feel too well. I'm tired. It's always like this when I haven't had enough television. For years, Anthony Perkins has played the sensitive boy next door who's always just a little disturbed by some deep inner conflict. Remember, luck favors the man with the most limpid minds, and I've got a bundle of them. Perkins has had a remarkable career that includes the Broadway stage and well over 50 screen credits. He is what is known in the trade as an actor's actor. In 1960, he was selected by director Alfred Hitchcock for the crucial role in the classic thriller Psycho. I think I've talked to you all I want to. It was this performance as Norman Bates that established him as a movie star. 22 years later, it is still the role he is remembered by, the man who made us all afraid to take a shower. Ironically, when Hitchcock filmed the shower scene, Tony wasn't even there. I was in New York uh, rehearsing a play, so when I first saw the scene, it, 
gave me the same chills that it gave everybody else. Here on the Universal lot in front of the Psycho Mansion, Tony recalls what it was like to work with Alfred Hitchcock. Since it was kind of a, a scary piece and a kind of a gothic piece, he just wanted to make sure that we all didn't get into it too, uh, too um, psychologically, and he was, he was eager for us to have a good time. In the years since Psycho, Tony Perkins has appeared in a variety of roles, and his range as an actor has continued to expand. And now he's back as Norman Bates in the movie sequel, Psycho 2. It's starting again. It's a 10. This, uh, the role of Norman Bates is a 10. You can't be, uh, um, I mean, if, you, if, you're, uh, if, you're in, if you're making a, movie, a psycho movie and you're playing Norman Bates, well, you've just got to be having a great time. It's, it's the best part. It's, the, uh, it's, it's just what it's all about. I, I really love it. Tomorrow on Action 4, a review of the movie Psycho 2. I'm Dino Lawley. A movie that's still at Four, three, two. movie that's still at the top of the list to see this weekend is, you guessed it, Return of the Jedi. The Star Wars trilogy comes to a fantastic and exciting end. George Lucas, to no one's surprise, has another hit on his hands. All of your favorite intergalactic characters are back, Luke Skywalker, Princess Leia, Han Solo, and Darth Vader. This extravagant and extraordinary film is the most technically accomplished of the three films. There's action, suspense, adventure, comedy, sensitivity, and of course all the secrets are unveiled this time around. Return of the Jedi is rated PG and it gets a 10. In another type of action film, Roy Scheider stars as a pilot in an exciting movie called Blue Thunder. Scheider is a police helicopter pilot who suspects the worst about a new police surveillance chopper called Blue Thunder. This is a fast-moving thriller that has the old cinema classifications of good guy versus bad guy. Malcolm McDowell, in this case, plays the bad guy. Blue Thunder does have some plot troubles, but the aerial sequences are superb. It's rated R, and I give it an 8. If you want some fright and suspense, try Psycho 2, the sequel to the classic Hitchcock film Psycho. Anthony Perkins as Norman Bates is released from a mental institution after 22 years. He returns to the old mansion on the hill to find things are still not all right. He finds notes from his dead mother, phone calls, and more murders. Psycho 2 is a good movie that's rated R, and it gets a 7. Other films worth seeing are The King of Comedy, Max Dugan Returns, and Poltergeist. Breathless and Space Hunters are all right. They both have their moments, and both are just pretty average. And that's about it for now. I'll be back here next week with more flicks to pick. I'm Dino Lawley. After 22 years at a mental institution, Norman Bates is coming home, and what a homecoming it is. Psycho 2 deals with Bates' homecoming. Now, Bates, of course, is played by Anthony Perkins. For those who never saw the original movie Psycho, Perkins was committed to a mental institution. He had a split personality. He murdered seven people as his mother. He dressed up like her, talked like her, and everything. Now, one of his victims from the original movie, Janet Lee, was murdered in what is now a memorable scene. Well, that's one way to take a shower. Well, when Perkins is set free, Vera Miles, portraying Janet Lee's sister from the first movie, is outraged. She brings a petition to court protesting his release, but to no avail. Now, supposedly cured, Perkins returns to the old Victorian house on the hill, the one he once shared with his mother. His psychiatrist, played by Robert Legaya, helps him to the house, reassures him everything is fine, and leaves. But all is not all right, as we soon see. Perkins finds a note left by his mother, the one that's dead. And while standing in front of her old room, he has a peculiar feeling. Norman! Yes, strange things are beginning to happen. Now, Perkins gets a job as a dishwasher at a local diner. It's there he meets Mary, a waitress played by Meg Tilly. She has a fight with her boyfriend. He throws her out of their apartment, and with nowhere else to go, he stays at the Bates' house at Perkins' invitation. Uh, aren't you going to eat? No, I, I, I just suddenly lost my appetite, but you, you, you go ahead. 
I lost my appetite too. Now, in lieu of giving too much away, I will just say the rest of the picture deals with the strange happenings. Perkins gets phone calls, supposedly from his mother. There are more notes, and there are more murders. Is Norman really cured? His old trouble seems to be haunting him again. As for the performances, all are very believable and good. Anthony Perkins, in particular, does a superb job as the troubled Norman Bates. Vera Miles, McTilly, the entire cast adds solid support. Of course, the original movie Psycho is considered a classic. It was directed by Alfred Hitchcock, and to direct a sequel from one of his movies is difficult. And Psycho 2 director Richard Franklin, I feel, did an excellent job, and I think Hitchcock would be pleased, with one exception. Toward the end of the picture, there are three or four scenes which contain what I feel are uncalled for explicit gore and violence. I really felt they were cheap shots. After an impressive directing job, they are all of a sudden lower their standards by giving us this cheap stuff, and I didn't like it. Hitchcock never would have resorted to that type of filmmaking, even with today's standards. Anyway, on my rating scale, I'm giving Psycho 2 a 7. The movie has quite a bit of humor in it. It's entertaining, scary, and funny. The acting is good, the writing is good, and there are some very interesting plot twists. And the ending is a surprise that will uh, play with your mind. I'm Dino Lolly. Jerry Lewis, a consummate clown outside, a half a dozen totally different people inside. Director, teacher, musician, best-selling author, and more. He's a soft-hearted humanitarian on one hand, but a tough-as-nails survivor on the other. So I wish everyone out there a hearty heart attack, and have open heart, and knock off the smoking, because it's going to kill us. I've done a lot of stuff in, in the 51 years that I've been performing, and there's a lot of stuff to come and I haven't really even scratched the surface yet. Jerry's latest movie role may also be the best ever. Going straight as the nation's biggest TV talk show host in Martin Scorsese's film, The King of Comedy. He's co-starring with Robert De Niro, who plays a would-be comic, who will stop at nothing to get a shot at the top. As movies go, it's as offbeat and different as the people who made it. Bobby De Niro and Marty Scorsese could have done Cuckoo's Nest without anyone else in the cast. What are you doing? Are you crazy? Get in, get in, Jerry. Between the two of them, I was ashamed that I was just crazy. Thanks to those many hours of practice, my sister Rose has grown into a fine man. The picture is magic. It smells of magic. It felt like magic. It's just one more medal for De Niro, because he's brilliant. Yeah, they used to beat me up once a week, usually Tuesday. To be a fine monologist, if that's what he chose to do, because he could learn to do anything. Bobby could do anything. And if you knocked me out, you got extra credit. There is the comic inside of every human being, just as we have antibodies that help us survive. I think God also gave us the awareness to understand that humor will get us through what is not all that easy on a day-to-day -day basis. And tomorrow on Action 4, I'll review Jerry Lewis's latest movie, The King of Comedy. I'm Dean O'Lawley. The first thing that needs to be said about this movie, The King of Comedy, is don't go see it if you're looking for laughs. Yes, some parts of it are funny, but this is not a comedy film. It is in many ways a sad film, it is thought-provoking, and it makes some interesting statements about show business in general. The King of Comedy follows the adventures of Rupert Pumpkin, wonderfully portrayed by Oscar-winning actor Robert De Niro. His character is obsessed with getting into show business. He is mentally imbalanced and frustrated. His idol is TV talk show host Jerry Langford, played by Jerry Lewis. De Niro wants to be a stand-up comic, like Lewis. He wants to be a host of his own TV talk show, like Lewis. De Niro lives in a make-believe world. He believes the daydreams and hallucinations that his desperate mind conjures up. He is, in short, a showbiz junkie. At home in the basement, De Niro has concocted a fake TV talk show world with cardboard cutouts of Jerry and Guest. And here he pretends once again as the king of comedy, making an appearance with Jerry and Guest, Liza Minnelli. And, yeah, I know. You look wonderful, too, Jerry. I wasn't leaving you out. <laughs> right. Yeah! <laughs> oh, Jerry, I love this guy. Always.
always coming up with these great lines. I love them. I love them. You're wonderful. You're wonderful. I, tell you, I don't know what I'd do without you. Rupert, anyway. the bus is here. It's early. Try to be on time for once. I can't believe this. <laughs> I got to go now. Yeah, I got to catch a bus. Jerry, take care of yourself. Baby, be good. Good luck in Rio. De Niro is so desperate to get a big break to get into show business that he kidnaps Jerry to try and win an appearance on the most watched TV talk show in the nation. Now, along with a rich autograph hound and semi-warped lady, Marcia, played by Sandra Bernhardt, De Niro concocts this bizarre crime. Robert De Niro's character well, really is a jerk. So He's obnoxious, but yet he is sincere in his efforts of trying to get into show business. You can't help in some ways from getting caught up in his own little world. You feel sorry for him, and De Niro's portrayal of this character is great. And Jerry Lewis, in a surprisingly subdued role, is very impressive. His character, although famous, is alone and empty. Lewis's performance is cool, calculated, restrained, and wonderful. He is truly a fine dramatic actor. Sandra Bernhardt and Diane Abbott are very good in their roles. Martin Scorsese once again proves he is an excellent director who can get his message across to the audience very cleverly. On my rating scale, The King of Comedy gets a 7. This is a sometimes disturbing film that has some unanswered questions. The ending is not at all surprising, though. The King of Comedy has something to say. It's about pain, desperation, and obsession. It's an effective movie. I'm Dino Lawley. For most of us, the action in the skies these days is out of this world. At a time when astronauts go for spacewalks, there doesn't seem to be much action left in the skies where the gravity of Earth keeps you from getting carried away. But that's not true for Corky Fornoff, who believes high-speed action and danger come in small packages. One-person mini-jets, the 300-mile-an-hour acrojet he helped to build. There are only two of them in the world, and both belong to him. For years, Fornoff has been one of the world's leading aerial acrobats, but the trick that made him famous was a television commercial in Japan. Uh, it's the first time that I have ever been able to track down uh, a jet flying through a hangar. Uh, the last time I saw an airplane go through a hangar, Frank Talman did it in the movie uh, back in the late 40s, and it was a very large military hangar. And he did it with an old biplane. I'll tell you what, my heart was in my throat. The funny thing was, was the Japanese kept telling me how cool I was, that I was very cool for doing this, you know, and I didn't want to tell them I was scared. No guts, no glory. That's the sort of thing we expect movie heroes to say, and it didn't take long for Corky Fornoff to blend his aerial daring with one of Hollywood's most exciting heroes, James Bond. In the newest Bond film, Octopussy, Roger Moore uses the mini-jet in ways no other plane can perform. He even went so far as to borrow a real-life incident that happened to Fornoff one day when his plane stalled and he had to make an emergency landing on a busy highway. He picked out the lane where traffic was going in his direction, landed, and took the next off-ramp to find a gas station. For James Bond, the event is just a breather between adventures. Fill her up, please. The latest Bond movie, Octopussy, opens tomorrow here in Oklahoma City. I'm Dean O'Lawley.